And tonight, we are very pleased to welcome two UMHS alumni. One of them is a familiar face. It's Dr. Soren Esfold. Uh, and Dr. Esfold has led a few of the live stream discussions in the past focused on LGBTQIA plus medicine. And since we last spoke, he has started a new job as a sports medicine fellow at Travis Air Force Base, which is in Fairfield, California. Welcome back, Dr. Esfold. Hey, thanks for having me again. Thank you. And I'm also very pleased to welcome Dr. Grant Ralston. He is a UMHS graduate from the class of 2019. And Dr. Ralston is a sports medicine fellow at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Hi, Dr. Ralston. Hey, thanks for having me. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. So we are going to start first with a few introductions um, and get a little bit more information on background. So Dr. Ralston, we're gonna start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to UMHS? Yeah, uh, so it was definitely an interesting journey. Um, I uh, started uh, undergrad at Wichita State University. I ran track, I was a jumper and sprinter on the track team there at Wichita State all four years. Uh, once I was getting closer to the end of my career there, uh, junior, senior year, is when I really, really honed in on wanting to go to medical school. Um, and at that point, uh, really had ton or multiple different things I was going through, trying to figure out if I wanted to stay in the U.S., go to the Caribbean, um, go across, grow across the country. Um, and it was something that my wife and I really had to go through the pros and cons of, of everything. And I'd actually had a track mate, um, uh, older, uh, teammate on the track team who had gone to Caribbean medical school and loved it. So I think talking with him, talking with my, uh, wife's dad, who was a family med physician, talking with both of them, uh, really, uh, honed in on going to the Caribbean medical schools. Um, and once I, uh, got accepted into UMHS, we looked, at more and more of the stuff about the medical school and just fell in love with it. Um, uh, I, I knew it'd be a, a great place for me to start my medical career and honestly a great place that could eliminate a lot of distra um, distractions and be a great place for me to, you know, sort of a launching point for me to start. Fantastic. And what yeah. were just some of a few of the reasons why you chose UMHS specifically? Yeah, I, you know, it was, we loved the island. We thought it was a beautiful island, a safe island. We loved that the class sizes were smaller compared to some of the other Caribbean medical schools that have, you know, notoriously known for having massive groups of people coming in each semester. Um, so I knew I'd be able to get more of that one-on-one -on -one teaching, more on one-on-one -on -one relationships with professors. Um, and then I knew they already had several different hospital systems across the United States that they had affiliations with that I'd get great training during my third and fourth years as well. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And Dr. Esfold, you have had a career change since we last spoke, and we're going to get more specifically into that in a moment. But for the people in the audience who haven't met you before, aren't familiar with you, could you tell us a little bit about your background and your journey to UMHS? Sure. So originally I'm from Montana, which does not have a medical school in it. So I had to apply um, broadly. Um, and when I did, I actually didn't get an interview my first year that I was applying. But I got a flyer in the mail from UMHS that was like, apply now, you know, I'm able to enroll by, you know, this fall. And so I did. And so it was a very quick turnaround for me from actually like applying, getting accepted and then starting, I think was in like a two month period. And mostly like I did it because I didn't want to wait another year and go through another application cycle and spend all of that money and going to the Caribbean sounded exotic. So I definitely did my homework. I checked out the school um, and then ended up starting there in 2013, fall of 2013 um, and loved it. You know, spent two years on the island, spent two years, the last two years in Georgia um, and ended up doing my residency in Georgia at Medical College of Georgia and had a great time. It was tough, but it was definitely worth it. Fantastic. Um, and now just to chat with both of you about your clinical experience in medical school and just sort of the next steps, putting the pieces together and how that prepared you for your current 
um, career in sports medicine. So Dr. Ralston, again, we're going to start with you. If you could just tell us a little bit about your clinical rotations and the background that kind of set you up for your current fellowship. Yeah, uh, I did my entire third year up in uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, with one of our hospital affiliations up there, uh, right outside Michigan. And then I did my fourth year, uh, sort of bounced around the Midwest. I, re I would reach out to hospitals ahead of time. Uh, I was sort of looking at places that I knew I'd want to possibly match for my family med residency that I feel like had good sports medicine ties. Um, so I tried to schedule my fourth year rotations in places that could benefit me for residency and fellowship. Uh, so I loved my rotations. You know, it was, it was awesome being able to do my entire third year with U.S. medical students. So right off the bat, you'd be able to see sort of where you're at, where you stack side beside the U.S. students. Um, uh, and then fourth year, like I said, just scheduling auditions at places that either had a sports med fellowship in that city or places that I knew I'd be able to get great sports medicine exposure during residency. And just to sort of piggyback off what uh, Soren said earlier, um, I was sort of joking. My wife and I have always said that we had like a a two-year honeymoon, being able to live down on the on the island sh shortly after getting married. Um, we, we we honestly loved it, and we're already trying to plan a, a trip back. So that's fantastic, great. And then I know during um, during our call when we were preparing for this um, for this discussion, you had mentioned that you were um, a part of an unopposed family medicine program. And I was just wondering if you could kind of define what that means and how that might have given you some clinical work that prepared you well for your current position. Yeah. So unopposed means that there are no other residencies in that hospital. So where I did my residency was at um, Cox Health in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, and we were the only residents in the entire city. So it's, it's something to definitely look into as you're starting to think about rotations and audition rotations and applying for residency, because by being unopposed, it, it means that we were able, we were the ones running the hospital service. We were running the OB service. We were getting to do pediatric inpatient with no pediatric residents. Um, you know, so it just, it allows us to sort of be first in line for anything that comes in through the door and then getting very hands-on, which I think benefits you as a sports medicine physician, both with your physical exam, getting to get hands-on with the ultrasound, which you use all the time now in the sports medicine field, uh, whether that be with OB or patients that you're rounding in the hospital. Um, so yeah, unopposed just means that you're, there's no other residencies in that um, hospital or city. So especially within family medicine, there's usually a big difference between if it's opposed or unopposed. Got it. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and I should have mentioned at the top of the discussion. And um, so I'm going to do it now because I forgot. Uh, if anybody tuning in has any questions for Dr. Ralston or Dr. Esfold, please feel free to drop your questions into the chat on whatever platform you're watching this discussion. We're going to be monitoring the questions and we'll um, be happy to share your questions with Dr. Ralston and Dr. Esfold as we um, talk about their careers in sports medicine. So Dr. Esfold, um, up, up now with you, can you tell us a little bit about how your, um, how your clinical experience kind of helped prepare you for your current fellowship? Yeah, for sure. Um, it did not. <laughs> like, like we mentioned, I kind of took a left turn in my career. So I ended up doing, I went to family medicine residency at Medical College of Georgia, which is a huge facility. It was wonderful. Um, we were not an unimposed residency. There was probably 10 other residency programs there. Um, and we all worked together. It was a huge hub for the state of Georgia for medical care, which was really cool. Um, and so as family medicine, of course, we did inpatient, outpatient, stuff like that. And I did an enormous amount of LGBTQ medicine and transgender care medicine. That was like my passion. I kind of fell into it, but I, there was no one else championing it in at MCG or in that part of Georgia. So I ended up giving like over 25 lectures throughout my three-year course in residency and traveled and gave presentations and really kind of prepared other specialties how to do better LGBTQ care. 
Um, at the time, I was a reservist in the Air Force. I had direct commissioned in in 2020 at the beginning of my residency. Um, and the Air Force left me alone. And they would email me like every six months, but they would pay me on top of my residency salary. And then they were just going to claim me at the end of residency when I graduated. So I really didn't hear anything from them. But then I heard somehow through the grapevine that as an Air Force member, as an Air Force physician, I was open to a sports um, fellowship or a women's health fellowship. And so you had to apply for those. And I thought, why not? Like, I'll just apply for it. And I don't want to say like on a whim, like I've always been an athlete. I've always loved sports medicine, but you know, that's, it was not the focus of our family med program. And somehow, luckily between them only accepting six fellows for, um, in the air force for this year, I ended up getting one of those six positions. And it's only one of two positions here um, out at Travis air force base. So that was my um, left turn into sports medicine. And so I knew that in December before I started fellowship in July. So that last six months, I was um, taking as many sports um, rotations as I could, um, slash ortho rotations, stuff like that to kind of get me ready for it. So I have a weird background that's very heavy in outpatient family medicine, very heavy in LGBTQ medicine, and now getting very heavy in sports medicine. Perfect. That's, that's a very interesting career path that you've taken. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's great for the people tuning in to see that once you start down a certain path, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're locked into that path, right? That there are other opportunities to maybe go in a different direction that, that fits with your interest and your goals. And so I think it's, it's great to have um, someone on the panel who can speak to that. So thank you. I think it's very classic of like, if you're just open to doing what you love, like opportunities come at you without expecting it. And that's kind of what happened here. I'm absolutely in love with sports right now. Um, and it's been a re really nice career change. Absolutely. So I think this is probably a good time to kind of pause and um, take a moment to define really what it means to be in sports medicine. And so um, Dr. Ralston, I am going to shoot this one over to you. If you could just define for people tuning in, what is sports medicine? What are some of the reasons why someone might need to see a sports medicine specialist? Yeah. So sports medicine, I mean, uh, it's essentially the care of, of athletes. Uh, and by athletes, it doesn't mean an athlete at a university or professional athlete. It means literally anyone who's wanting to stay active, stay healthy. And ideally, as you know, family medicine providers, we're trying to be preventative. And I think with sports medicine, a lot of that is trying to keep people as healthy and active as possible so they don't get all these other chronic illnesses and diseases. Um, I think with sports medicine, it's a newer field. Like the it's It's been around, obviously, for a while, but with the development of these sports medicine fellowships and all these uh, new job openings, even, you know, as, you know, applying for jobs, a lot of areas are sort of new to this idea of what all exactly a primary care sports medicine provider can, can do for the hospital system. But it's, it's really combining our love for staying active, taking care of athletes. Um, and that's anyone from a, a three-year-old who falls and breaks his arm to a, 80 year old who's, who's still trying to stay active and do cardio and in, in the pool, you know, and, you know, it's, it's anyone and anywhere between, um, it's just trying to keep them healthy and active and, um, doing also at the same time, primary care alongside that, because we're sort of the experts in primary care for them as well. Okay. I think that's, I think that's really helpful. I think for a lot of people, they do kind of associate sports medicine with really just, professional athletes or, um, maybe just, um, people that, that train a lot, the kind of weekend warriors. Yeah. And so I think it's helpful to know that it could also, it, it spans, you know, anybody that's, that's active and you're really focused on musculoskeletal health yeah. and, you know, all of those things. Could you tell us just a little bit, um, because you work with the university of Arkansas, can yeah. you just describe for us a little bit about the types of patients that you see in your practice? Yeah. So yeah, each, each, uh, sports medicine fellowship varies, uh, to some degree, some are more university based. So like how I am, I'm right in the middle of it at a SEC. So SEC is just a, a conference in division one at a SEC university. So for me, that looks more like I'm taking care of a lot of these elite level athletes and professional athletes at the university. 
But then at the same time in clinic throughout the day, I'm also seeing people in the general population that are coming to the sports medicine clinic. Um, so a unique aspect of my fellowship is I still get to take care of everyone uh, from the general population any, of all ages. And then I'm also getting to work with all the athletes at the university for University of Arkansas and travel with those teams. Um, since I was a college athlete myself, it's one of those things that I just love elite level athletics. I love being around that. I love the drive that those patients have. Um, so I think it just depends. Each sports medicine fellowship is different. And that's another thing when you're, if you're looking at sports medicine, trying to figure out what type of fellowship you want, because that sort of determines maybe some jobs you can get after if, if you want to be more at, out in like a rural city or just outpatient versus at a university. Perfect. And you kind of touched on one of the follow-up questions that I had for you, which yeah. was, do you work a lot with the Razorbacks football team? Do you travel yeah. with them? How much of your, how much of your practice is in the clinic and how much of it is um, working with the university athletes and kind of traveling with the team? So every day I'm doing both. And that's, a, that's the thing I love about the fellowship is no, no two weeks are the same, um, you know, depending on what season it is. So during football season, I was working uh, with Arkansas University of Arkansas football team. I was on the sideline for all their football games. I got to travel with them, which was pretty fun. Like when I went down to University of Florida, um, and I've got to travel with the basketball team already. So I I am taking care of the athletes, and then I'm also taking care of the general population. Um, but uh, each week is different. But uh, no matter what week it is, I'm always going to be in clinic throughout the day. And then in the evenings or on the weekends covering sporting events. And that can be anything from swimming and diving to track to basketball to football. That, that also includes training room after the games. Uh, we also have training room throughout the week. So we'll be on campus, for example, on like Tuesday morning, seeing uh, athletes from all the different sports who have any issues that they need to see a physician for. Um, so it's just been really fun to build those relationships with all the athletic trainers athletes um, and everyone else on campus. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then Dr. Esfold, you are probably working with a very different, you're working in a very different environment probably with the military. Was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your practice and what kinds of patients you see. Yeah, so I'm actually working on base four to five days a week at Travis Air Force Base. Um, which is totally different from what I was doing. I have to actually wear a uniform um, to see patients. And our sports clinic is pretty robust and we have good access. There's me and one other fellow. So I have a co-fellow. And so when we're on base, usually we'll see the majority of like enlisted folks or veterans coming in. Um, and you'd be surprised, like with the enlisted folks, there's a lot of like mechanics you see or um, like special operations, like men and women who will come through who just have hurt shoulders, hurt knees, and need to be seen like that. And then usually the older veteran population who same thing, have banged up knees, hips, shoulders, and they need to come and be seen. So that's, um, that's pretty cool because they're, they're a very respectful population. They're usually either very young or very old. And then two days a week, I work in an orthopedic clinic um, one very close to Napa and then one, another one in Oakland. And so with that, we're kind of the interface between the orthopedic surgeons and then family medicine. And so oftentimes if there's an easy, I don't want to say easier case, but a non-surgical case, they'll come to us first to try and get worked up and to try and get treated. And then if we can't do anything else for them, then we'll introduce them to the surgeon and say, Hey, like it's, it's time to think about an operation. So I have a whole gamut of a population that I work with, but working with the military side of it's very different, um, but still equally enjoyable. There's a lot of camo going on. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. We do have a couple of questions from the audience. So I'm going to kind of pause from, um, from our outline and, and jump into some of those questions from the audience. Um, and so Dr. Ralston, I'll start with you on this one. And then um, Dr. Esfold, if you could chime in when Dr. Ralston is finished. But the first question is, what were your residency research projects? And do you have any recommendations on topics for um, a competitive application for sports medicine? So Dr. Ralston, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I can answer that. Uh, during residency, uh, my research project and uh, each fellowship is different on what they expect or what they like. So this can vary depending on where you're wanting to go for residency or fellowship. Uh, mine, uh, 
it was one of the reasons, like I had mentioned earlier, it's why I picked this residency because they already had a pretty robust research project going on that tied into sports medicine. But mine was on EKG, uh, EKG abnormalities in uh, college athletics. Um, so we got pretty lucky um, that when we had started or when the residents before me started it, then COVID happened. So COVID, I started residency in 2020. So my entire residency revolved around COVID. So we were able to sort of piggyback that project into what EKG changes you see in athletes who had COVID as well. Um, so it was a pretty interesting study. We did it on two of the universities in Springfield, Missouri on a, over hundreds of athletes. We looked at all their EKGs. We would try to figure out if we saw any abnormalities and then if they needed any further uh, workup. Um, there's a whole nother, uh, there, it's called the international criteria and it's something that you learn during fellowship or residency, but there's a specific sort of criteria on what EKG abnormalities are normal or abnormal in athletes, because it could be normal in an athlete, but abnormal in a regular, like in a non-athlete. So, uh, it was, it was a good introduction for me to sort of prepare me for fellowship. Um, but yeah, so that was what I did during residency. Everyone does, uh, does, uh, different research. Uh, projects or case presentations. Um, so it, it really just depends on on the access you have during residency and, and where you're wanting to apply. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Espel, did you want to add to that? I think to what makes your application competitive is you have to be really authentic. Um, I know what worked for me is I just talked about all of my athletic experiences I mean, growing up, I was a skier. I was a collegiate cheerleader. I started weightlifting, like all of those things. And I kind of talked about how my athletic journey changed over time. And that's what kept me interested in sports. And that's what allowed me to have a greater interest in sports medicine. Um, so I think if you definitely come at it from that angle, that's very helpful. Um, but really try and come up with like an authentic foundation for why you want to join sports medicine and what it means to be a sports doctor for you, like what your career trajectory wants to look like, or just what inspired you in the first place. Um, I think that it goes a long way. I think that's great. And just, there's another question on here that I think kind of ties into what you were just saying, Dr. Eswold. So I'm going to see if you could respond to this question that came in as well. And that is, how were you able to build relationships with people in sports medicine in your third and fourth years of school to prepare yourself to match? So I think you kind of touched on that a little bit, but if you could expand on that, maybe. Actually, I think that's a better question for Ralston, because okay. honestly, I didn't know anyone in the military sports medicine world. There's only 35 of us sports med docs in the Air Force nationally. Um, so it's a very small population. Um, I was lucky that one of them was our sports doc at Medical College of Georgia. He retired from the Air Force and came on there. Um, but I didn't know anyone in the sports world. And then my co-fellow who came from the military um, residency programs, she knew everyone. And so that really helped her. So actually I'm going to punch it over to Ralston because I think he might have a better answer. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I totally can. Um, I think it's <clears throat> similar to residency. So for family medicine, we have the AAFP or American Academy of Family Physicians. It's like the governing body. They hold a conference every year, uh, normally in Kansas City. Um, the, for sports medicine, one of the main, uh, governing bodies is called AMSSM. Um, and it's, they also hold a conference every year. So that's one way right off the bat, sort of an easy way to experience what all being a sports medicine fellow entails. It, and they also hold a fellowship fair at that conference every year where they have fellowships from all across the country and the fellowship directors there for you to talk to them. Um, that's one way, definitely trying to get involved in the AMSSM as early as possible. Um, and then also, if you go onto their webpage, um, you can see where all the fellowships are at and trying to just email either their program coordinators, trying to set up like away rotations or auditions. Um, those are some, some ways that you can start networking to help your chances for fellowship match. Um, that's what I did because we did not have a sports medicine fellowship in my, in Springfield, but throughout my years during residency, I would attend that conference. And then I um, would just try to slowly build those relationships over the years. Perfect. Thank you. 
And then if we could just um, talk a little bit, I know we haven't really talked a lot with um, doctors who are working in the military, for example, or working with, um, you know, sports teams at a division one school. So Dr. Esfold, if you could just tell us a little bit more about what you like about working as an Air Force doctor. Yeah, um, the security is great. So like I owe them a four year commitment after, um, after fellowship and I already have a position set up. They're sending me down to Texas to work at Lackland Air Force Base because they, they need a sports doc down there. So like, I don't even have to apply for jobs. Um, so that's really nice because they just, they put you where they need you. Um, so the security is great. The pay is really great. And I don't want to say that from like a superficial aspect, but like my life is pretty well packaged within the Air Force. Like they pay for your housing. You get a like a food allowance. Um, you get TRICARE healthcare. So you have really good healthcare for like the first time ever. Um, you have like unlimited access to like the hospital, urgent care, et cetera, which is really great for my family. Um, and so like you're taken care of really well. So that was definitely kind of one of the smarter reasons that I made this decision. But then in terms of the medicine, like I, right now, my fellowship's embedded within our family medicine de um, department at Travis Air Force Base here. So I'm constantly surrounded by faculty and residents. So it's like, if I don't know anything, I can always go ask another faculty member. And they're always very willing to help because I think they know that, again, I'm going to be number 37, you know, for a sports physician. So they're going to polish me up and make sure that I shine and can operate on my own. Um, for any at any level and so they really invest a lot into you and they are very good at setting you up for success so i've really enjoyed that and then our clinic system is actually really good in the air force um we're probably still understaffed like the rest of the world thanks to covid um but at least like being in kind of a big medical healthcare setting we always we still have our resources and being in the military we will always have those resources so if we're out of something it gets ordered and directed like deposited to us the next day and so our clinics i feel like they run really well and they're always they're better staffed but they're always very resource rich which i really like so the job security is great <laughs> perfect well and i think i mean you, you touched a little bit on compensation and i think that that is a very practical um, you know, it's a practical topic. It's something that's obviously top of mind for a lot of people that are going to be tuning in that have student loans. And so yeah. I, I think that that's, you know, that's very relevant and top of mind for a lot of people. Um, I know that you had mentioned too, during, um, during one of our calls that working with the military too, you also have the advantage of longer, um, longer time with, with, that with your patients, oh, the yeah, yeah. time is mm -hmm. longer. So was just wondering if you could maybe talk about that a little bit too. Yeah. So currently I work in two clinics, my sports medicine clinic on base, which we have almost like 45 minute appointments. They're like 40 ish, but you're well spaced. Um, so you have plenty of time to see the patient, work up the patient, bring out the ultrasound, do any sort of procedure like injection or, um, or just get more in depth with the ultrasound and then come up with a plan and send them on their way which when I go and work for Kaiser in like Oakland or in Vacaville here, um, you have 20 minutes appoint appointments. And so you're, and like most of their providers don't even bring out the ultrasound because there's not time to look and diagnose and do a procedure. You're really kind of just assessing the patient, doing a quick physical exam, and then deciding then and there if you want to give an injection or have them, you know, go out for imaging and come back. And so it's nice because we are set up um, for just longer appointment times in the middle, in the um, sports medicine military setting, which I, I really enjoy because then I can kind of relax and develop a better plan and investigate with the patient real time in front of me. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then Dr. Ralston, if you could talk a little bit about some of the advantages of working with an SEC school, what you like about that. Yeah, I, I would say it's definitely and I, I've always loved living in college towns. I feel like it keeps you young and active. Um, so I definitely loved living down here at a, in a college university, college town. I think with it being a SEC school, sort of the resources that we have are, are, are tough to beat. We're always at, you know, the forefront for facilities and equipment and ultrasound machines and just all we have access to in that regard. Um, I, we may talk about this in the 
later in the, in the video, but sort of some of the new treatments that we're starting to offer, like uh, the PRP or platelet rich plasma um, with it being at a large university like that, we never have to worry about cost because a lot of the athletes, it just gets covered regardless. Um, uh, so things like that are definitely uh, beneficial. Um, and just, it's really fun being able to travel with the teams, get to know all the athletes, um, you know, for some of the athletes you get to take care of, you, you know, are going to be playing like in the NFL or NBA the next year. So it, it's fun to be able to get to know them. And I feel like if you can, if you can take care of those elite level athletes, you can learn how to manage, you know, between the agents and the, and the parents and the coaches and the athletic trainers trying to learn how to navigate all that. It prepares you for your future. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and the next question kind of ties into another question that came in through the chat. And um, that is that, you know, I think we all recognize that sports medicine is a relatively new field. And so the question that I was going to ask was what opportunities there are for medical school graduates that are considering a career in sports medicine. And the question that came into the chat was, what are your plans after your fellowship? And so if we could maybe um, kind of combine those two, those two questions, what your practice might look like after your fellowship and what other opportunities there are um, in the field. Maybe Dr. Ralston, if you want to respond to that one first. Yeah, totally. Uh, so uh, my plans, I recently actually recently signed. So I have my first job lined up for next year. I'm going to be doing a uh, hundred percent sports medicine uh, back in Springfield, Missouri. So I'll be working at a sports medicine clinic where orthopedic surgeons and then also primary care sports medicine doctors work. And then I'll be covering some of the local universities in town. Uh, so I'm still going to get that high level college athlete coverage and exposure, but then also working in the sports medicine clinic four days a week. Um, uh, so, I, and I feel like for sports medicine, at least, uh, it really depends, you know, some people finish fellowship and they'll do like 50% family medicine, 50% sports medicine. Some people will do hundred percent sports medicine. Some people will work at a university. I think because it is a newer field, a lot of places are sort of catching up on what all a, a primary care sports medicine doctor can actually uh, do in the clinic. Um, and sort of what uh, Soren was saying earlier, um, a lot of orthopedic surgeons, you know, at, at, first we're a little nervous, like, Oh, like, are these guys going to steal all of our patients or our injections? And what we've actually learned is if you have a primary care sports medicine physician and orthopedic surgeon, we end up, the orthopedic surgeon will only see patients in their clinic who they're probably going to operate on. So it sort of increases their like strike rate. And so that way they're not wasting their time working all these patients up doing uh, corticosteroid injections, visco supplementation injections, PRP injections, physical therapy, all these things that we can do. And then that way, by the time it gets to them, they, we know they've probably already tried all these other preventative measures and they need surgery. So it actually ends up benefiting both parties. Um, so that's sort of a side tangent. Sorry. I, that's something no, I that's, like talking that, about. No, uh, that's a, that's a great answer. I think because, that's really Cause you'll see some, and cause sort of back to the original question, some sports medicine, after you finish fellowship, you'll just sign with like an orthopedic group and you'll just, you'll sort of work with them. So there's all sorts of different jobs. Just like how I said, no, no weekend fellowship is the same. I bet every single fellow that finishes sports medicine fellowship will probably have some variation of a job following fellowship. Perfect. I think that's, I think that's very helpful. And um, Dr. Eswold, I know that you had mentioned that you already have your next step um, locked in, that you're going to San Antonio. Um, and so I have two questions for you. And one of them kind of combines another question that came into the chat. So let's start with that. Um, and that is, as far as the military, can you take a step back and talk about how you got into the military from a Caribbean med school. Yeah. So that's the question that came into the chat. And then my kind of follow-up question is post-military, where do you see your career? So that first question is actually great because it was tricky. Um, I made the decision to, um, to direct commission into the military as a way to help kind of pay for residency and pay off some student debt, stuff like that. And I did a program called FAP, which is like financial assistance program. It's a military acronym. Um, 
And it's the weirdest, most gray area thing you can do to get into the military because most people don't know what to do with me. Um, or they've never, because most um, docs in the military, they go through you know military med school and then military residency. And so they're kind of all shunted in the same direction. And then I just kind of appeared out of nowhere and landed amongst them. But it, in order to become eligible for that, I had to have landed a US-based residency. So I was not eligible. And I remember starting my application for the military almost a year before I matched into Georgia. And a lot of them said, okay, like you can fill out the paperwork. We can't file anything until you match with the US residency. So then as soon as I matched at Medical College of Georgia, I went back to the Air Force and said, here it is, here's my letter of acceptance. And then they started their whole process um, of go, doing the background checks, doing all the paperwork, getting all of that. And that was about a six month pr um, process. And it's a ton of paperwork. You have to like fill out everything from like where you've lived, every location for the last 10 years. Um, you have to have like multiple background checks, multiple people who will vouch for you. Um, it's a big process. But I just sat down and kind of like chipped away at it over a period of a couple months. But it did take about six months start to finish. And then once I had the U.S. residency, like it was much easier from that standpoint. Um, and I don't, I don't regret it at all. Like it helped supplement my income during residency, during COVID, which was very helpful. It allowed me to buy a house during residency. It allowed me to pay off some debt, which was really nice. Um, in terms of my post-military plans, so I owe them four years at this point after fellowship. I don't know why they don't count the fellowship here, but they don't. And so that's my decision point. I think it's like 2027. 20, and so I can decide either to re-enlist in the military and they usually give you some pretty competitive bonuses, like, like re-signing bonuses um, to do another like four-year commitment or six-year commitment, something like that. Or I think you can even do like another two-year commitment. Or at that point, I can decide to go into private practice and try and get on with a team or an orthopedic group um, and just do sports medicine. And so I don't know, honestly, what I'm going to do yet. Like, it's been a good experience. I think I'll have to wait to see how these four years go. But the military, like, takes care of you very well, which is nice. Um, and I make, like, I hate to say it, but, like, I make plenty of money to live a nice lifestyle that I want. So there's no regret on that end. It's less than what Ralston's going to be making, probably, because so much of our... Um, our salary is, you know, caught up in like TRICARE and the housing benefits and the, the living stipend benefits, like all of that. But it's not bad. Like I can still vacation. <laughs> so we'll see in four years where I end up. But it's been a great gig so far. Like I don't have any regrets at this point. That's perfect. Thank you. Hopefully that, I think that answered the question. Um, and I know that there was a question that came into the chat asking for um, for contact information for both Dr. Esfold and Dr. Ralston. So if you have other specific questions for either of them, we will be sharing their contact information at the end of the live stream. So just, um, just know that if you have follow-up questions that are specific to either Dr. Ralston or Dr. Esfold, that you will have the opportunity to get their contact information so you can reach out to them with those questions. Um, and Dr. Esfold, you just mentioned something that I think is important. You, you touched on how you joined the military and how it's providing you with a great lifestyle. Um, and so just wanted to talk a little bit about your work-life balance working in this field and um, just a little bit like kind of day in the life. How would you characterize your work-life balance for anybody that would be considering going into um, either met practicing medicine in the military or as, a, um, as someone that's doing a fellowship in sports medicine? Yeah. I think work-life balance is crucial. And I think as a med student, you need to learn how to develop that and how to protect that and how to set boundaries and say no, because um, medicine will take over your life, but medicine will always be there, okay? So you don't feel like you have to sacrifice and kill yourself for medicine, because that's not, that's how we burn out. That's how we beget depression. And I've given several lectures on physician depression and suicide. It's not worth it, okay? Set your boundaries. That being said, my work-life balance is pretty good here. I'm usually done by about 3, 3.30, and then I'll go to my training rooms in the afternoon, which are usually pretty chill. I'll spend an hour with the athletes there. And then usually I'm home. Most of the time I'm off on the weekends unless I have a game to go to or my team is traveling. 
Um, but right now, probably three out of four weekends are pretty free. So it allows me to, you know, go travel into San Francisco or go into wine country, stuff like that. Um, but I think you have to protect that work-life balance. Um, you have to let people know when you're feeling burnt out or if your case, your patient loads too much. Um, it's important to advocate for yourself. Um, but my kind of daily routine, it's a little bit different. Like I'm up at 5.30 in the morning now, so I can do about 30 minutes of cardio and then eat, get ready, put the uniform on and go to base by seven o'clock, which is very early. I'm used to starting clinic at like 8.30, <laughs> waking up at eight and rolling into clinic at 8.30. Um, and you're not, you'd have to be very prompt in the military. <laughs> uh, and then I spend like all day on base till about three or four, um, either in clinic or doing didactics or practicing with the ultrasound, stuff like that. And then some nights are, are pretty long. Like some nights I'll come home and I'll have 20 minutes to eat and then I'll have to drive out to Napa for a game. And then I'll be watching wrestling till 7.30 at night. Um, so those are the long days. And then the short days, like maybe I'll get done at 3, 3.30, go to one of my training rooms and just be there for an hour and then I'm done and I'm home studying till about like seven-ish. So it's not bad. Your fellowship year is intense. You have 365 days to learn everything there is about sports medicine and get very competent at it. So right now I've taken a couple like three day weekends, four day weekends, but most of the time I'm trying to read at least an hour or two every night. Um, I'm pretty active during the, my entire week, um, just between clinic and learning. And then I would say you're going to get the most out of it, what you put into it. So like I try and hit up as much of the training room hours as I can so go to as many games as I can. Um, or like, even like I live a mile from one of my training sites. And so if their athletic trainer calls me and she's like, Hey, like this, you know, student jammed a finger playing basketball. Can you come look? Yeah, I'll go check it out because they may need something, but it's also good for me to get that experience. And then I can call any of my, like my officers and ask them if they need, like what their opinion would be on this. So it's a lot of work right now. It's, I hear that my clinic hours in San Antonio are going to be much better. So I just figure, you know, I'll have more vacation time at the end of the summer, but right now, like I'm enjoying it. It's not bad at all. Um, but there are some busy days, but a lot of them are great days. Well, weekend trips into the city and wine country sound, sound pretty nice. So come to Napa. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. And Dr. Ralston, if you could tell us a little bit about your work-life balance. Yeah, I think it, it depends on the season, you know, being at a university like this, uh, football season was very intense. Uh, you know, I didn't, I don't to be up quite as early, uh, as Soren does, uh, but I still get up early just cause I have two young children and that's really my time to actually be able to, to study and focus. Um, but normally clinic every day from like eight to three thirty, eight to four. And like during football season, uh, then we head over to practice. Um, and then after practice, you have training room. So during football season, every day was about 8 AM to around 7 PM. Um, and then on Friday nights, you, well, I, I had my own high school, so I'd cover the high school football game. And then Saturday you have football all day long. Um, so during football season, you really get one day off and it's Sunday. Um, uh, and then as the year goes on, like now during basketball season, we're not as busy every night, but there's like, if there's a game on Tuesday night, I'm on campus still until like nine or 10 PM. Um, so it just depends. Uh, it just sort of ebbs and flows, but the good thing is, um, you know, my attendings at my fellowship are awesome. And, you know, if there, if there's like a random half day that there's not a whole lot going on, they'll be like, Hey, go hang out with your, you know, your family or, um, I think everyone gets it because, you know, once you get to fellowship, you've already sort of put in a lot of hours for residency and medical school. And they know that you're doing this sort of on your, like you wanted to go to fellowship. You don't have to go to fellowship. So they want you to learn as much as possible, but they also want you to enjoy it. Um, and that's the, other, the fun thing about sports medicine is, you know, working the weekend, you're, you're covering a football game. It's not like you're at, it's not like you're at the hospital admitting 10 people. Uh, um, so it just, even though sometimes it's work, it's, it's fun work. And here at the university, we get tickets to all the games. Like my wife and our kids, they'll come. If I'm working the volleyball game, they'll come and hang out with me or they'll come to the football or basketball games and be up in the stands. So I think it's, um, the hours can be long, but it's what I love. So, you know, it's, it's really, it doesn't even really feel like work when you're just, when you're getting to cover basketball or football or a lot of these games. That's great. 
Yeah. Thank you. And this yeah. actually, we had a question that just came in through the chat, um, Dr. Ralston, that I think ties in with that. And um, that question is, what is your best sideline sports injury that you've treated? Um, we've had a couple of dislocations that I've got to reduce. So those are always a little um, intense when they're initially happening because everyone's sort of freaking out. You know, it, the arm looks very strange. Uh, so I would say those are always interesting. Uh, we've had um, a couple pretty bad uh, ACL or knee injuries, like multi-ligament. We had a knee dislocation. Um, so things like that, learning sort of the protocols. Um, and the first couple of times you do each one of those, like the first couple, like couple of times you really feel the ACL tear where like, there's no, like the laxity is just massive or you feel the arm completely dislocated. Um, definitely gets the adrenaline going. feels like the first time you're in a code when you're in residency or something. Um, but, uh, I would say definitely those either the dislocations or, um, even, um, more, some of the more, not as intense ones, but like concussions, learning how to rule out some of those, um, it's, it's really fun. And just like with medicine, no two, no two diagnoses are the same and they never show up. Like they say they're going to show up in a, in a textbook. So, so you just mentioned head injuries, which was actually going to be my next question or tie into my next question. And that is that we've obviously seen a lot of reporting in the news about the long-term impacts of sports related injuries particularly head injuries. Um, you know, concussions have been a huge topic of conversation in the NFL and the NBA, um, across sports. I mean, Soren mentioned that he was a cheerleader. We see tons of injuries, right, with with cheerleader, with cheerleading. Um, so if you could, I'll start with you, Dr. Ralston, and then I want Dr. Esfold to weigh in. But if you could just talk a little bit about some of the new treatment options in sports medicine, not necessarily tied to head injury specifically, but any, um, any new treatments that you're, um, that you're seeing that, that you think are exciting. Yeah. I think, uh, just like with medicine, everything changes every year. Like I was taught things my intern year that then we learned by the time I was a third year, we were doing it a different way. Um, with concussions, you know, you used to get told once you have a concussion, go lock yourself in a dark room and don't do anything. And, now we've started to learn that that's not true and trying to keep the brain active, trying to still exert yourself a little bit. Um, so there's actually just a new consensus statement released on concussion and sport related concussion. Um, so, uh, that continues to evolve. Um, also, like I mentioned earlier with the PRP or platelet rich plasma, that's a new field that's changing a ton here. Um, and all that is, is so with PRP, you are actually taking someone's their own blood. So it's not, you're not having to worry about getting blood products from someone else. You actually draw their own blood right there in the clinic. And then you put it in a centrifuge or maybe some other machines. And then you inject the platelet rich part back into them. Um, and sort of the, the thought process behind that is you're sort of introducing some of these pro-inflammatory molecules and cytokines to help stimulate or augment what the other therapy that you're doing to treat that disease. Um, that's a newer, a newer thing that's starting to come out. Um, I feel like the reason why it's not more commonplace is because it's just not covered by insurance yet. I think, I think once it gets covered by insurance, it'll become a lot more popular because I mean, you're not doing it for no reason. Like usually when you're doing PRP, it's, they've already tried, they've already tried and failed, you know, anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, they've already failed physical therapy and they don't want surgery. So, I mean, at that point, you're just trying to do anything you can to keep this patient healthy and active. So their blood pressure stays under control so they can continue losing weight. So, I mean, it's one of those things that, um, I think once insurance comes around on it, unfortunately, all of our life is ruled by insurance. Um, uh, it'll become more commonplace. Perfect. Thank you. And Dr. Esfold, do you have anything to add in terms of new treatment options that you're seeing yeah. in sports medicine? So Ralston mentioned this earlier and comparative to our other sports fellows or sports counterparts who've been practicing for like 10 years, we're trained on the ultrasound, which is really neat. So like we get this state of the art piece of technology and we can go in and we can scan any muscle or tendon or joint and look for tears or hematomas or edema. And with that, 
we have incredible accuracy to either inject straight into like that joint and hit a target, a tiny, tiny little target with the ultrasound and a needle or pull out fluid um, and, or just look at for diagnostic value. And sometimes it's even better than an MRI value and it's in real time. So we can manipulate the patient while we're looking at them under ultrasound. Um, and they don't have to be sedated for it and it's quick and it's painless and it's such an important tool for us. And I bring that up because like I was working um, in my ortho clinic today with a family medicine trained sports doc and she's been practicing for like 10, 12 years. And she made a comment about needing to get an MRI to look at the patient's hip to see if there's any pathology going on. Whereas if we had an ultrasound in the room, because she wasn't trained on it and it was her clinic, I could have whipped out the ultrasound and looked at the patient's hip and we could have made a better decision then and there to see if the patient needed an injection or further imaging or what have you. Um, so being able to use the ultrasound is such an incredible tool that we're getting trained on. And it's kind of a newer thing right now that just makes our job so much cooler and so much more effective for the patient. Very cool. And then we're getting kind of close to the end of our time. I'm excited to see that we've had so many great questions in the chat. Um, and so I appreciate Dr. Eswold and Dr. Ralston, your, um, your flexibility and being able to jump right in with these questions as they come in. Um, but just to sort of wrap up, any general advice that you have for current or prospective medical students that are interested in sports medicine? And so Dr. Eswold, I'll start with you if that's okay. Yeah, um, I think the best thing you can do is start networking, um, start volunteering with a team, even if you're just going in and watching what an athletic trainer does and how they wrap people or assess injuries. Um, or if you can, you know, just see if you can shadow in a sports clinic or in an ortho clinic and just get that kind of experience and networking on top of it will be so much better because then you can actually write in your application, oh, I saw this and it made me think about this. And that's such a better way to approach getting into sports than saying, oh, I really enjoy, well, granted, that's exactly what I did say, oh, I really enjoyed sports. <laughs> um, but doing that sort of networking is going to be so helpful. Going to the conferences um, like the U.S. Um, or the USAFP, that's our military one, but like the AAFP conferences or the AMSSM conferences, stuff like that. So you can just see faces, meet people, make a memorable impression on people so that your application is more than just a piece of paper. Um, that's going to be so helpful. But an interest in sports is pretty, is crucial, is great, but it's not the only thing you need. Um, but definitely show people your passion and why you're interested um, and that'll help get you far. Perfect. Thank you. And you mentioned um, one of the websites that you mentioned was the AMSSM website. Could you just tell us what that stands for? Oh, God. Uh, or I think American, American here. Medical American Society, Medical Society, Society. for yes. Sports Medicine. Yeah. For Sports Medicine. Yeah. Um, and they're a great website for sports medicine. They have a lot of stuff for like residents, students, fellows. Their conference is coming up in. March, I believe, or April, a April, yeah. April, mm -hmm. yeah. um, yeah. whenever I'm supposed to be there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they, they're a great resource um, for you to just check out and it'll answer a lot of your questions. Yeah. And on that, I think Megan just posted it on the chat. Um, but on that website, they even have like the roadmap. So I don't know where it is on the website, but they have like a roadmap for what you should be doing as a medical student, as a resident. Um, and I totally agree with everything he said. And just really, just like residency, if, if someone can just see your face and remember that, it, it just differentiates you and sort of makes you stand apart from all the applications that they're getting. Um, and that's the thing with fellowship is for residency, there may be like five spots or 10 spots at a place. But for fellowship, there's normally only like one or two fellows at each university or hospital. So it's really about making that impression and just letting them know that you're interested. Um, so everything he said, and I would just add on trying to do like a rotation or even if you can only go shadow for a day, just letting them know that you're interested in that program. Perfect. And um, any other comments about maybe finding a good mentor? Did that play into kind of your skill development? Yeah. Um, on Once again, we, we keep mentioning it, but on that, the AMSSM website, 
you can search for um, like fellowship trained attendings in your area um, through that website. And so trying to find someone who's done a sports medicine fellowship, either in your city or a city close to you and just reaching out to them um, or just like an orthopedic uh, doctor or sports medicine doctor in your area, someone that you can just sort of start working with, learn good musculoskeletal exams and workups, anything that um, just gets you in the, in the ballpark of sports medicine will help. Perfect. Thank you. And then just before we wrap up, just wondering if there are any other points that you want to share, Dr. Ralston, anything else that you think is important for people tuning in to, to know? Um, I think, I think being from the Caribbean, it almost gives us a, a leg up because we have connections with cities all across the country for rotations. So it really opens up the door to try to find uh, sports medicine providers, you know, in, in those big cities that we do rotations still in Atlanta or Detroit or Chicago, there's tons of sports medicine opportunities in all those cities. So I think um, just trying to think, plan out ahead of time. And that's really going to be what sets yourself apart is um, attending things like this, even attending this webinar, it's giving you a leg up because you're learning a bunch of valuable insights on how to become a sports medicine physician. So continuing to try to beef up your resume, but most importantly, just try to connect with someone who can, um, you know, teach you the steps to becoming a sports medicine physician. Perfect. Thank you. And Dr. Esfold, how about you? Any other kind of final thoughts or words of wisdom? I think words of wisdom. Um, <laughs> I think you really have to try. Honestly, like when I applied to this fellowship, my program director straight up told me, you're not going to get it because there's a whole point system in the military and you have zero points. So, you know, don't worry about that. And our sports doc um, at MCG was didn't write me a letter of recommendation. Same thing. He said, you're not going to get it. You have no chance of getting this. Um, so it's not going to be worth your time. And I respected both of those. And I still went ahead and I still applied just because I thought it would be a great exercise. It gets my face out there. And I ended up interviewing at both programs. And then I even somehow messed up the application stating that my number one position was at the Washington, D.C., um, base when I really wanted the Travis one and I still locked down and somehow got this one. So don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to try start early. Every application cycle I've ever gone through, I've always started on day one of the application opening and just being organized and just getting on your ducks in a row, but put yourself out there try. The worst thing you can do is fail. And then people will give you feedback and say, Oh, this would have been better on your application or, Oh, next year apply to us, but we already know who you are and what you look like. And we know you, you as the person who's already applied to us. So don't be afraid to try. You know, what's that saying? Like, if you shoot for the moon and miss, you'll still land among the stars. Like, do it. Okay. And just at least try. And you guys are from UMHS. We have great success stories. Okay. You can, you're prepared well. You can do it. So if you have any questions, um, hit us up. Perfect. Thank you. And that's the perfect transition. Um, just to thank you both for your time tonight. We are going to be sharing both Dr. Ralston and Dr. Esbold's email address. So again, if you have any questions specific to them and what they are doing, it should be in the chat right now on whatever platform that you're using. Um, please feel free to reach out to them. They're obviously very nice people, very helpful, very eager to um, you know, support fellow UMHS students and prospective med students. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you do want to um, go back and review this discussion, a recording will be posted to the UMHS um, live events page on YouTube. That's also a fantastic resource for other past discussions. So please take a look, visit, um, visit those videos to get additional information. But again, thank you to Dr. Esfold and Dr. Ralston. Thank you to everyone tuning in and have a good night. Thank you. Thanks everyone.